Sam and I am the English Gamer and on today's episode we're carrying on with our two-part retrospect of the original Nintendo Game Boy. So far we've taken a look at the hardware as well as an overview of some of the finest games and if you haven't seen Part Uno yet, well, what's wrong with you? Anyhow, enough said, let's begin where we left off and say hello to this small swell cartridge. The Game Boy Camera was released in 1998 and it basically turns your Game Boy into an insanely primitive digital camera. This was a big deal back then since digital cameras were in their infancy and film cameras were still the norm for photography. It soon became obvious that these new gadgets would play a big part in our everyday lives in the not so distant future and so, in typical half assed Nintendo fashion, we were given this contraption which upon its release was the smallest digital camera in the world. When playing with the Game Boy Camera these days, the photos look hilariously grainy, almost like a coffee stain, but back then, it was a pretty impressive novelty. Just the idea of using something like a Game Boy as a fully fleshed camera sounds utterly insane. I mean, that's kind of the equivalent of making a 3D printer for the 3DS, a print for the iPhone, or using a PS3 as an actual console for gaming. Granted, the pictures are low quality, making a YouTube video from 2007 look like a 4K showreel, but for what the Game Boy is to offer with only 4 grey shades, it's really not a surprise. There's a range of various methods to take pictures and self timers to trick lenses and even panoramic shots. You can turn the lens around with seamless 180 degrees rotation, therefore you can shoot photos of the wild outdoors or take self portraits of your own pathetic self, no filters involved. There's more to the Game Boy camera than just being a poor man's David Bailey. You can add stamps and drawings to your candid shots and the whole package includes tools to make your own animations as well as an array of mini games where you can take a picture of yourself and play around for fun. Space Fever 2 is the sequel to an arcade shooter game made by Nintendo before reaching worldwide fame with Donkey Kong and at the beginning of each game, several ships will appear that will send you to one of the three other mini games in this list. Ball is similar to the 1980 Game & Watch title of the same name but with you as the character and music strangely taken from an Israeli folk song. DJ is a music tool where you can create simple chiptune beats and Run 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 is a button mashing dash to the finish line where you're up against a bird and a mole which can be unlocked after scoring 2000 points on Space Fever 2. Unfortunately, you can only store 30 images inside one card and there's no way of uploading any of them to a computer. You can however use this, a Game Boy printer, to print out your fine fruits of labour with thermal paper technology as seen in tickets and receipts. Yeah. In my day, the art of producing a self-portrait was not an easy thing to do. A lot of quirky easter eggs are hidden in this game. Pressing up and down on the d-pad changes the speed of Mario's dancing in the title screen and pressing B during the credits will show Mad Dancing who appears to be Shigeru Miyamoto. The menus have a bunch of interesting themes including aesthetics from your average RPG game here like the good old run button that takes you back to the- OH MY GOD! Seriously? What the hell are these monsters doing in my game? What kind of crazy shit was that? Toasty. Overall, the Game Boy Camera is one of the weirdest titles ever spewed from the wise old Nintendo Volcano and since its release, camera functionality has been built into modern portable systems including a DSi, 3DS and PS Vita. With a cool gimmick to boot and a cavalcade of benevolent shenanigans, it might feel like a hipster's wet dream rather than a proper game, but the sense of the big end's wonderful charm is burning strong here and this is definitely an awesome addition to anyone's gaming collection. Let's talk about the Pokemon series and where it all began, the Game Boy. 
The popularity of this million dollar franchise is evident all over the world, with an anime, a trading card game, toys, and a diehard fan base that's hard to please. Pokemon Red and Blue were released in Japan as Pocket Monsters Red and Green in 1996, before heading overseas in the late 90s and spawning an unholy phenomenon like never before. Millions of kids went ballistic, and thousands of parents became dazed and confused with a few tainted souls treating the craze as some sort of satanic possession. No joke. So, so Pokemon is a game that teaches children how to enter into the world of witchcraft, how to cast spells, how to use psychic phenomena. Pokemon World is a world of the demonic, of the satanic. Anyways, you play the role of a ten-year-old boy setting out on his first Pokemon journey in the Kanto region. You're taken to the laboratory of famed researcher Professor Oak, where you meet the sly son of a bitch of a grandson named Gary Mother Chunking Oak, and choose between a Barbasaur, Charmander, or Squirtle. Your first battle is against Gary, who always chooses the Pokemon strongest against your chosen assassin, and afterwards, you embark on a journey to become the very best. Like, no one ever was. As you can see right off the Zubat, this game is an RPG with an overworld to navigate the main character, menu interface to configure items, gameplay settings of Pokemon, and a side fee for battles. The main objective is to beat the 8 Pokemon gym leaders of Kanto who specialise in certain types, essentially the boss battles of this game, and then take on the Elite Four to face off in a battle against the newly crowned champion, who appears to be Gary Oak, fresh out of training in the most ratchet of clunge. But to become the ultimate master, you're gonna have to run through a lot of battles against wild Pokemon and trainers aplenty. In every battle, you have four moves to use for each Pokemon, and once you gather enough experience points, one shall level up and sometimes may evolve into a new Pokemon. Furthermore, the journey is often disrupted by the criminal masterminds of Team Rocket, a Kanto organization hell-bent on abusing and stealing Pokemon for the sake of world domination. Another big element to this game, or really any Pokemon game in general, is to catch Pokemon with Pokeballs with a sum of 151 cute critters to catch. Well, I say cute. You can only have 6 Pokemon at once, so what happens to all your other captured creatures? Well, they're transferred to boxes in PCs accessible on every Pokemon sense where you can hear your team if one or doesn't faint during a battle, and the information of every new Pokemon caught is stored inside the Pokedex, and this is the assistant that's basically the Encyclopedia Botanica of all things Pokemon. Connect two Game Boys together with a link cable, and you can battle against your friends or even trade Pokemon with each other, making a side quest of catching them all a hell of a lot easier. Trading is in fact encouraged, with Red and Blue featuring monsters exclusive to one version, it's pretty much mandatory to trade in order to complete the entire Pokedex. Back in 1999 of course, now there's about 700 of these buggers in total, multiplayer modes are now online and are mostly just a big mess. To finish things up, Pokemon Red and Blue are great kickstarters to a highly influential series that has gone to change the video game industry for good. It took 6 years for Satoshi Tajiri to create this timeless gem, with creative backing from Miyamoto and financial struggles at Game Freak along with the countless hours of unpaid work and sacrifices, all of which immensely paid off. As a result of its strong start here, Pokemon is everywhere and is considered by many as a way of life, which might sound a bit crazy at first, but hey, at least Pikachu here is not an ugly Lardas compared to Shrek and every Titan from Attack on Titanium. Following the success of Red and Blue, Pokemon Yellow was released, quintessentially the director's cut of the two games and pretty much the same as before, but with better graphics and a strong emphasis on Pikachu along with the elements taken from the also popular anime. Jesse and James help out with the dirty deeds of Team Rocket, and the Pikachu becomes your starter Pokemon and always follows you around with plenty of personality in store. You can examine its feelings to see whether you're adored or dismissed. It can torture you, and you can even play a totally radical surfing minigame if your Pikachu knows how to surf and print out your high scores with a Game Boy printer. But unfortunately, my copy no longer works. <sighs> Damn it! Will this ancient Atari game give us hope? No, sure isn't. As the world delved into a new millennium in the year 2000, it was also gifted with a significant entry to the Pokemon series with gold and silver on the Game Boy Color. These games take place in the Johto region, spawning of new Pokemon never seen before with a ton of important gameplay mechanics added to the mix. Day and night cycles, berries, Pokemon able to hold items, Pokemon breeding, shiny Pokemon, real time internal clock, youngster Joe? The focal premise is similar to the first installments. 
you're a rookie heading out on this first Pokemon journey and you climb your way to the top by defeating gym leaders, the Pokemon League, and not to mention a shitload of trainers, wild Pokemon, Team Rocket mischiefs, and the odd encounter with a legendary Pokemon every so often. And once you become the king of Johto, you get to revisit the Kanto region, updated to conceive with the events surrounding this game? Holy crap! Pokemon Gold and Silver are perfect sequels to the original series, and once again, the lovely pair sold together like hotcakes sprinkled with super strength Viagra. Pokemon Crystal soon followed with animated sprites, a big chunk of the story dedicated to Suicune and Yusin, the option of playing as a female trainer, and the battle tower where trainers can fight other trainers one by one. Now, I can spend ages talking about the first two generations of Pokemon, including the spin-offs, but I'm gonna have to stop here. In conclusion, Pokemon Red, Blue, Yellow, Gold, Silver and Crystal are all an absolute joy to play, even with all the new regions and Pokemon of today. Everything about these classics are awesome with barely any problems worth stressing about. The gameplay, the story and hell, even the glitches are pure satisfaction to be had. There's also a gold mine of remakes on the Game Boy Advance and DS, with Fire Red and Leaf Green and Hearts Gold and Soul Silver all worth checking out, with improved visuals, gameplay, and even more awesome tunes to blast out on the go, not to mention the upcoming remakes of Ruby and Sapphire on the 3DS. No matter what opinions you have, you really can't help but give out a round of applause to what these games have done to the gaming industry and RPGs as we know them today. This is unmatched gaming bliss at some of its most utter sublime. Super Mario Bros. Deluxe saw released on the Game Boy Color in 1999, presumably as a tech demo to show the meat and bones of the Game Boy Color, and if so, the boffins at Nintendo did a brilliant job of porting the timeless NES veteran for a new generation to enjoy, as well as the inclusion of Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels. The real Super Mario Bros. 2 must have added not that glorified rehash of Doki Doki Panic splashed with Mario's chubby mug. Everything here appears to be the same as before, with no substantial changes to the gameplay, but a few cool additions to justify the title's use of the term Deluxe. Your progress is saved throughout the game, there's fortune telling, the ability to print banners and stickers with a Game Boy printer, if you still have one, a calendar, and lots of unlockables to redeem. Probably the best new feature is the challenge mode. In this mode, you get to play through all 32 levels of Super Mario Bros, only this time, you need to collect red coins and Yoshi eggs and your high score depends on how well you did in the challenge. Not to mention, there's also the U vs Boo challenge where you race against a Boo and switch barriers to get to the finish line of a selected range of levels. I guess my only issue about this game is the camera. Because of the Game Boy Color's small screen, the whole field of play has seen a pretty drastic change in size, which does definitely hinder the enjoyment of this game since it makes it harder to react to incoming enemies and executing jumps over platforms and gaps. Overall, Super Mario Bros. Deluxe is a superb port of one of the most iconic games of all time. There's no shame having a quick look on the Game Boy, but if I'm being brutally honest, the NES original is still the definitive version of Super Mario Bros., and the SNES and Game Boy Advance remasters all stay faithful to their vintage roots. As for Super Mario Bros. Deluxe, everything here is undisrupted in addition to the extra add-ons, and you can even go as far to say that this game was responsible for the creation of the wonderful Super Mario Advance series on the Game Boy Advance, but then again, it's just a theory, a game theory. This game is highly enjoyable and it deserves a spot on anyone's video game collection without a doubt. Rayman from the folks at Ubisoft saw release on the Game Boy Color in 2000 to a dozen of mixed reviews. The original Rayman was released across many platforms a few years earlier and became a cult hit among the bonafide civilization of the 90s, with its tantalizing charm, reminiscent of a cartoon, and a notoriously high level of difficulty that caused anyone to cry in tears of pain, sorrow, and agony. With the release of such a magnificent game on a portable system, you're usually expecting a washed down bog standard rehash, but as for Rayman on the Game Boy Color, that kind of description does not match here, a bit like Luis Suarez and Hunger, and Chris Brown paired with women. First of all, for what the Game Boy is to offer, the visuals look very nice, all crisp and clean. The gameplay runs smoothly and replicates the allure of its console granddaddies quite well, including a tough, harsh nature. 
Secondly, the music is an array of decent renditions of themes from previous Rayman entries, and finally, the actual game itself is not strictly a port of the original. While it maintains the same story and plot as the first Rayman, the levels are in fact taken from the sequel, Rayman 2, which is kind of funny really because the beta was actually in 2D rather than a beefy Super Mario 64 competitor in 3D, so technically, what you've got here is a completely different Rayman title served up on your 8-bit plate. All in all, this game is by no means incredible, but it does a pretty solid attempt to dissect the elegant characteristics of the first Rayman into a portable solution with such limited resources. If you ever feel brave and daring for a new challenge, a term I'm using loosely here, then have no worries with this overlooked title, it could very well be a blessing in disguise. Star Wars Episode 1 Racer flew across store shelves around the world in 1999, the same year we were all treated to George Lucas' latest magnum opus. Well, sort of. There's not too many things to talk about here. The music has a couple of good, head-banging MIDI rearrangements of Star Wars compositions such as Duel of the Fates, and the gameplay runs at a very rapid rate, similar to the proverbial experience seen on titles like F-Zero. You can pop in one AAA battery on the cartridge to activate rumble functionalities which emit a violent sting upon smashing and crashing. Unless your copy is held hostage by a wrinkly corroded battery that's been enclosed in a prison for pretty much more than a decade. The coolest thing about this game is something kinda unexpected. Here, take a look. Oh my giddy aunt, full motion video on the Game Boy Color? What kind of magic sorcery is that? Seriously, that's absolutely incredible. I didn't know the Game Boy Color was just as powerful as the Sega CD. Although most licensed games tend to be quick cash-ins for the latest groovy trends, you might come across a diamond in the technical rough. For instance, here's Motocross Championships 2001, also on the Game Boy Color. You'd think the developers of this game would be champions at making you fall fast asleep, but no, the gameplay is utterly jaw-chopping. Just look at it! How is this even possible? It looks just as good as your average title on the 3DO! We could have had an early portable Mario Kart using these incredible techniques! Anyways, back to our main presentation. Star Wars Episode 1 Racer is definitely an impressive title on the Game Boy, and it's also available on other platforms which can only assume are just as good as this title, if not better. There's an absolute ton of Star Wars related games to choose from, and this is one of the good entries. Unlike this one damp mess of an acid trip. If you're ever in the mood for some classic high speed action, then don't be shy about giving this game a chance. Besides, it's pretty cheap as well, so if you enjoy old school racing fun but don't want to spend the equivalent of a Millennium Falcon during a shopping spree, this game should definitely fit the bill. My last pick for the day goes to Shanty. I mean, Shantae. Released at the tail end of the Game Boy's life in 2002, this game has been sadly ignored since its release, partially due to obsolete hardware with the more advanced Game Boy Advance already in stool shelves at the time, and that's just completely unacceptable. Published by Capcom and developed by WayForward Technologies, this daring adventure takes you on the role of a hot chick named Shantae, who's embarked on a mission to reclaim a stolen steam engine from the Seething Seas of Scuttletown where she was recently appointed as their guardian genie. Our heroine's nemesis is Risky Boots, who commands an army of Tinker Bats and as the self-appointed Queen of the Seven Seas, she plans to only use the steam engine for the sake of crimes against humanity. What you're seeing here is unbelievable for what the Game Boy Color's hardware can do with amazing gameplay using complex techniques and parallax scrolling, transparency effects to extremely solid frames of sprite animation, as well as a riveting 8-bit soundtrack courtesy of the bawling prophecy that's Jake Kaufman. Shantae herself is pretty weak despite the life of a half-genie. Her only tool of mass destruction is her hair. Yep, you heard me, our leading role can stun vicious enemies by simply whipping her hair back and forth. If you know what I mean. Thankfully, you can earn the power to transform into numerous creatures through the strange power of dancing with other genies, including a harpy for flying or a cutesy little monkey for climbing up high platforms. 
The levels are ace, smothered in a pool of creative talent everywhere you go and so is the overall presentation. The surroundings of Scottletown acts as the central hub, laid out for a unique third person view where you can save your progress, play mini games and get giddy with the locals. Plus, instead of the usual shtick of jumping straight into a stage, travelling from point A to point B involves you dashing through a serving of fields, foes and forests, adding a great sense of depth and atmosphere to the already well polished game. With such vast content jam packed into one small cartridge and the 32 megabit battery required to get the game properly working, many companies were reluctant to publish this game, but thankfully Capcom bit the bullet but with only 15,000 copies ever shipped, so good luck finding an original copy. Or alternatively, take a quick chip on the eShop and download it for under £4, $5, whatever. Because, you know, oh god. Since the release of Shantae with a sea of standing ovation mixed in, WayForward Technologies have continued their gravitational push for excellent software, everything from licensed franchises to glorious reboots and more original ideas like Mighty Switch Force. Even Shantae herself has given a whole lot of love with a sequel on the DSi and a bright future worth hyping about. In conclusion, Shantae is one of the best platformers ever made bar none along with its cult status. I highly recommend you to take the plunge and experience this excellent swashbuckling journey of Shakespearean proportions. 10 out of 10 would shiver me timbers. The game itself, not Shanty. Um, Shantae. Wow, how about that for a console overview? Lots of interesting information and comic relief all over the place. Thank you all for watching for this episode, especially to everyone who saw all the two parts combined. I mean, that 40 minute length. Wow, give yourself a pat on the back. Seriously. Anyways, please subscribe if you so desire. Until next time, I'll see you all later. Cheerio.